Okay, folks, are we ready to convene this final plenary? Wow, what a long two days. Um, it's been a bit busy. So thank you all very much for coming back. Um, I'm not going to say anything else other than to, to have the absolute pleasure to introduce Jackie. He's going to talk about um, her experiences of becoming a carer. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jackie Ashley. I don't think of myself as a carer. Um, I'm a journalist. I always have been. Um, but suddenly I have become a carer and it's rather freaky. What I'm going to do is tell you sort of my story and why I'm here today um, and then the lessons I've drawn from becoming a carer and as a journalist of course I write about it because that's what I do and uh, all the people who've then contacted me with their stories about caring which has given me a very interesting perspective. Um, I had done some caring before because my father, who died last year, had Parkinson's, and as a lot of you will know, that is a long-term condition, and he gradually became more and more disabled and ended up in a wheelchair. And although he had a full-time carer living at home, um, full-time carers don't work weekends, as you will also know, so I cared for him along with my two sisters every weekend. So I had some inkling um, of what was involved with caring. But then out of the blue, last January, my husband, who is the broadcaster, Andrew Marr, had a stroke. He was 54, he was very fit. It was the last thing any of us expected could possibly happen. In fact, at first, we just kept thinking it can't be a stroke, although it was pretty obvious to me when he was lying on the floor with half his body juddering and his face kind of frozen that it was a stroke, but I still couldn't believe it. And it was a stroke. We went into hospital, um, and he was frankly very, very lucky to survive. So all of a sudden, um, at 54, his life seems to be over, and I very quickly realised that mine was over too, because for two months we stayed in the hospital, Charing Cross, which is, I have to say, brilliant for stroke. It's one of the main centres in London. Um, and for the first week or two, we kept a sort of nightly vigil because we thought he might not pull through. So my three children and I were there pretty much non-stop. And after that, for the next six weeks or so, we went in every morning, we took turns to do shifts, we helped him. Um, and we started off being carers in the hospital because quite often if you have a relative in hospital, despite the wonderful nursing care, um, the patient does need someone else to help them with things, to know when they want to go to the loo if the nurse is busy and to try to help them to get there, to know when they're desperate for a glass of water and the nurse is busy, and so on and so on. Um, so we cared in the hospital and that was fine. Then we came home, and that's when the trouble started. Um, the first thing was my husband was on very heavy doses of warfarin, which thins the blood to prevent a further stroke. And I was told that, well, when he was home from hospital, could I just take him to the GP every day um, to get his warfarin levels checked, because this was essential? Yes, I said, fine, until I got home, and I thought, well, hang on a minute, he can't walk, I can't lift him, I don't have a wheelchair, the GP surgery is in a pedestrian precinct, how am I going to do that then? And no one had thought to tell me how I was going to do it. Well, the answer was I got my son, who's quite a big lad, and um, a neighbour's son from down the road, and we literally carried him. But, you know, it was quite clear that this was not um, going to be easy. And I sort of carried on like this with all the things that you suddenly realise um, in the hospital. There'd been a wonderful bathroom with a flat floor, and I could help him to shower. Uh, we got home, and I realised that the only shower we had was upstairs, and... The ledge was this high, and because his left leg was not working at all, he was never going to get in the shower. So I thought, well, what am I going to do about that? And again, I thought, no one's told me that I'm going to face these difficulties. Now, why should they, of course? Why should they? Why didn't I think about it? But just a little bit of planning, I think, before the hospital discharge um, could have done quite a lot to help those very early days, which were just so difficult, because every single thing became four times more complicated than it was before. Six months on, well, we're eight months on now, and I am in the very lucky position of saying Andrew has progressed hugely. He's gone back to work. I am stuttering back to work. Um, he can now walk, though with um, a foot drop. Uh, his left arm still does nothing, so he can't do shoelaces, shirt buttons, open jars of marmalade. The number of little things that you sort of don't think of um, become a day and daily frustration. Getting up in the morning is not quite the military operation it was. Um, it used to take about three hours, I reckon, to get him up through the shower, dressed and downstairs. It now takes probably one hour, which is substantially longer than it ever used to. Um, but by and large, he's pretty independent. Um, 
His speech wasn't affected. We were very lucky. Um, his brain wasn't affected. We were incredibly lucky. Um, but his movement remains difficult and challenging and I think will do for some time, although he's now doing three to four hours of physio every single day because he's determined to try to get as much movement back as he can. So that's my story. Um, in a way, very lucky, a brief six months of being a carer, and although I still have residual caring duties, shall we say, um, I'm not hopefully going to be a 100% full-time carer for the immediate future at least, though who knows what the future may hold. Quite often people who have had strokes tend to go back downhill again, I'm told, by people who delight in telling me the bad news as well as the good news. Um, I then wrote about this as a journalist. Um, I did, my editor at The Guardian said, can you just write some of the lessons you've learned from six months off being a carer? And so I wrote a little piece sort of saying, you know, various things that had happened and what I thought about it. And the response I had was just beyond belief. My inbox almost crashed, it was so full. I have had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I think with Andrew as well between us, we go into thousands of letters and emails and people saying, this is my story too, thank you for speaking about it. I know what it's like, I've had a stroke, I'm a carer. And all these people, their overwhelming message was, no one listens to us, nobody thinks about us, nobody talks about us. We are the hidden army of carers and patients who are stuck at home, not part of the political debate at all, um, not particularly helped by the professions in many cases, and please keep speaking out on our behalf. So I've become a kind of unofficial voice of carers everywhere, um, not in a whingy way, and this is the first thing people say, I don't like to complain, and I don't like to complain because certainly in my position, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, but, you know, carers will say they suddenly their lives are over as well as perhaps their patients or their relatives' lives, and yet no one quite takes notice of that. Um, so I've been putting forward a few proposals to the politicians. I, I was, well, I still am a political journalist, really, not a health journalist. Um, and it's surprising what support there has been, and I'm delighted that suddenly caring and the whole issue is coming up the political agenda. Um, at all the party conferences, there was quite a lot of discussion of it. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think um, you know, even David Cameron and Jeremy Hunt are starting to talk uh, in quite sensible terms about caring and carers. Um, so I want to talk first of all about what I think are the challenges for carers, and then just a few things more about the integration of the NHS um, systems from the acute phase to the, the long-term phase, which I have some, some thoughts about. Caring, I think above all, as I've said, there's a lack of information. You come home and you're suddenly faced with this horrendous new situation that you have no idea about. Um, and there just really is not much information. GPs, I've found, aren't particularly interested. They're dealing with the problems in the surgery. They're not particularly interested in that. Um, community people come round sort of once and then that's it. Um, someone very helpfully sent us a bar to put on the bottom of the stairs so Andrew didn't fall over when he came down. That was great. But that was about the level of it. Um, as time has gone on, we found out about all sorts of things which have made a huge difference. Um, things to stop the car door slamming on you as you try to hold it to pull yourself out. Um, Non-slip mats for the shower to stop you falling over when you get in. A thousand different things that, had there been the information, it would have made life so much easier. So one of the things I would really like to see is a sort of almost an information pack that you're given when you leave hospital. So these are the things you're going to need. Think about this. This is where you can get help. These are the kind of shops. These are the websites. And, you know, in this day and age, it's shocking, really, that there aren't good websites you can go to and to say, these are the kind of things that will make life easier for you. So I think information is, is absolutely key to it. Um, the second and much bigger thing, I think, is the world of work. Um, most carers, and I'm afraid they are mainly women, although there are plenty of men who care too, but most carers, and, and the majority of the ones who've written to me, say they had a caring responsibility, often for only a limited amount of time. In my case, it was six, six to eight months. For a lot of people, it's a year, two years, caring for an elderly relative, um, a mother, a father, or whatever. Um, and they give up work because they have to during this difficult time at home, and then perhaps the elderly parent passes on, or the husband, in my case, gets a bit better, and they want to go back to work. But in so many cases, they can't because they've stopped. And the world of work, while they're very happy to give maternity leave to women who'd like to take six or nine months off to look after their baby, which is fantastic, 
There's no sense that we should have carer's leave, which is, you know, if you have a, an elderly dad who's ne needing nursing through his final year, that you can give up work and then go back. Um, and looking into this, I find in other countries, there's a lot of schemes in, in operation. Germany has a particularly good one, I think, which is called family leave. You can take up to two years um, where you scale down your hours to 15 a week. Um, your salary is scaled down as well, and then you pay it back when you go back to work. Now, something like that, I think, is really, really innovative and sensible and would save so many people uh, this feeling that once they've cared for someone, they're on the scrap heap because there's nothing more for them to do. Um, so I'm hoping we can get a debate going in public policy terms on exactly that kind of thing, allowing people to... Um, to take carers' leave and then to come back and find the world of work isn't closed to them. When it comes to integration between the acute phase and the community phase, um, this is not for carers, this is for patients. I'm still struck, I hear politicians spouting all the time about uh, we're going to have a, a joined up service. And I think, well, where have you been? What are you talking about? Do you not know what happens? And so what happens is you're in hospital where you have fantastic care, usually unless you're unlucky. And you come home and suddenly it's all stopped. And the GP, if the GP is lucky, will get a letter um, maybe a week later detailing what's happened to you. And that's it. Um, there is nothing in the community really uh, that keeps you going. And to go from absolutely fantastic care to nothing just seems to be very strange. It's as if you're kind of, once you're out of someone's system, and they say this in the hospital, terribly sorry, you've been having occupational therapy, you've been having physiotherapy, you've been having your regular blood tests, you've been having help with showering, you've been having all of this um, for eight weeks. And then suddenly you go home and you're no better, your, your condition hasn't improved at all, but suddenly there's nothing on offer and it is just down to family. Now, in Andrew's case, he was incredibly lucky to have not only me, but I have two daughters who are um, actually in education but came home for quite a long time. And we all manage, but there's so many people who don't have this, who don't have a relative living nearby. And I just think, how on earth do they manage? How do they even make a cup of tea? How would Andrew, if I hadn't been there, have had anything to eat? Um, and it is extraordinary that no one seems to have thought this through. Um, I would really urge all the politicians to have to spend quite some time, not only visiting hospitals, you often see them visiting hospitals, don't you, because it's a great photo shot. Um, you know, there is someone with their sleeves rolled up, you know, visiting the hospitals, it's always a pleasure, but you never see them actually going to visit people when they're back home again. And I think this is this massive lack in our public policy again at the moment, is that it's considered once you're back at home, you're under your GP, but GPs are far too busy to be bothered with people with long-time complaints, um, people recovering from strokes, people with Parkinson's, particularly people with dementia. Um, I think although Jeremy Hunt is, is expecting our GPs to do an awful lot more, not only working 12 hours a day and all weekend, um, but also taking individual responsibility for every patient, it's a lovely idea. I can't see how it will work. But I feel somewhere in the system there is something missing that, uh, that means when people come out of hospital they're just abandoned. And that for me is the key to an integrated healthcare system, is that suddenly you're not just forgotten when you leave the hospital, but you're actually followed up. Um, and given, in many cases, the support that people don't get. So many people who've had strokes, and I've had so many of them in touch with me and with Andrew, they say they come home and there was no physio available for them. So they're left and they often spend the rest of their life in a wheelchair. Um, now again, from the research I've been doing and from Andrew's own experience, it is quite clear if you carry on with the physio way beyond the sort of three month point, which is what a lot of professionals will tell you is the point at which you will stop progressing. You can get a lot of movement back, but you do need to do the physio. Um, it is probably too expensive for it all to happen on the NHS. In fact, it certainly is too expensive. But some people wouldn't mind paying for a bit of physio. Um, some people would take some, some a week and... Sorry, two minutes, I can see that. Uh, some people would take some each week and then work on it themselves. But in this way, I think we would actually save money because getting people back to work and off benefits, as we're always being told by this government, is what we want to do... Um, not only be good for the economy, but it would help people's own family and quality of life as well. So much more needs to be done for this whole area of people in the community. And too often the NHS is it's hospitals, it's hospitals, it's GPs, but we're not thinking about what is so common for so many people, which is long time at home and not being very well. 
Um, I'd better stop there. I had a lot more to say, but I will stop now and perhaps pop back in in the, uh, in the session on the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie, and I think there'll be some questions for you. Um, can I please ask Anya, who has been um, the stalwart listener and um, convener of our people's panel. So she spent the last two days working with, with the other 13 members of the people's panel, who we'll hear from in a minute, um, and trying to digest some of the key messages and key themes and experiences of what the last two days have felt like, what we've heard, um, and what that might mean. Um, so, Anya, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this on? Can everybody hear me? Um, thank you ever so much. Um, just to explain, although I probably shouldn't have to, um, I'm sitting down because I am absolutely exhausted. And I stood up physically here um, probably over 24 hours ago to say that um, over the course of these two days, we wanted, as a people's panel, to try and embody all the principles that we keep asking you guys um, to embody. And one of those includes self-management. And I'll put my hand up and say the last couple of days have been possibly the biggest challenge in terms of trying to self-manage my condition. And I know that's something that all of my colleagues, now friends here on the people's panel, can echo. For us, there's been the most enormous physical cost to this, but it's been worth it. Yes, I'm able to walk from the chair to here now, but I'm not that sure that I'm going to be able to do this tomorrow. And I know a lot of my friends here won't be able to do what we're doing today, tomorrow, and we'll be paying for this physically for probably about a week to come. So remember that when you're sat in meetings on Friday next week. But it's also been really emotionally draining for us as well. Um, we've been talking about long-term conditions in terms of the physical presence of them, in terms of our symptoms, and what sort of clinical interventions and treatments we can have to try and manage them. But we've also supposed to be talking today about the parity with mental health as well. And so, although we all live with long-term health conditions, we've also found that emotionally these last couple of days have been really, really difficult. And that's because... Like I said yesterday, this is our lives. All the interventions and processes and policies and ideas that have been said yesterday and today, actually, that's part of our life. That's something that we face with every morning when we wake up and realise that a long-term health condition really does mean that we're living with all of this forever. But it's also been really emotionally draining because it's been really exciting and it's actually given us hope. And it sounds odd to say, but that's really emotionally hard work. <laughs> And it's been absolutely brilliant to be welcomed by you all and to be embraced. And I've had a lot of people come up to me and to everybody else and to say how much our contribution has been valued over the last couple of days. And I know that we're valued and we're respected because that's what you've all told us. But as a growing theme over yesterday and today, there can sometimes be a bit of disparity between the words that people are using and the actions that people are doing. Myself and the rest of the members of the People's Panel are here unpaid. And while we've been talking about how valuable patient and carer and people participation can be in health, that doesn't come free. And you need to resource participation in all its forms, in co-design of services, in co-design of research, peer mentoring, peer support, patient leadership. Whatever kind of participation you want, that doesn't come free. And I know the phrase, invest to save. Yes, NHS England have got to invest some money into this. Because actually, we've already invested quite a lot of physical and emotional energy into this. And we know that there are savings. It's just a case of everybody investing that in as many different ways as we can. To echo one of the comments that was made earlier today, um, we've been talking a lot about problems, um, but actually really where the focus needs to be is on the solutions in terms of what can we do to try and solve the daily challenges that we live with. And I think that those solutions can lie with us and we're really willing to help you to try and develop those solutions. And to echo something that um, Jackie said earlier, these solutions need a slightly different way of thinking. 
I've heard the term clinical pathways mentioned a few times already. And for me, a clinical pathway is just a sort of a nice flow chart that someone's printed off in the walls of a clinic of my consultants. The care pathway that I experience is completely different, and you couldn't possibly sum up on a flow chart on the wall of a clinic. So while the care pathways in clinics are important in terms of when we have acute episodes, so when we have a particularly bad relapse that makes us um, be in hospital, actually what's happened to all of those care pathways when we're just struggling with the normal day-to-day -day stuff that isn't really serious enough to put us in hospital, but from my experience can actually be more challenging than trying to cope with the crises. So, Clinical pathways can actually be very different to the real pathways that patients and carers experience. I also want to talk about outcomes, which is something that's been mentioned several times today, and Jonathan mentioned it when he opened yesterday, which feels like a very long time ago. The outcomes that we've been talking about in terms of mortality rates and um, bed days and all of those sort of things, they're really easy to count, but they're not what matters. We need to start looking at our outcomes in terms of measuring what matters and not just measuring what can be easy to count. But I appreciate that that's really easy to say, and actually there are some considerable barriers into actually making that a reality. And I think we've identified some of those today. One of them appears to be budgets. Not necessarily the fact that it's limited or the quantity of the budget, but the way that it's so fragmented, and it sounds like that's really limiting some of the innovation that I know you're all really desperate to do by some budget constraint. And we had a very interesting conversation over lunchtime. This budget wasn't created by Mother Nature. It wasn't something that we just <laughs> found. It was something that's been created by people and probably therefore actually can be changed by people as well. So although it's a barrier, I don't believe it's something that's completely insurmountable. And the other barrier is time as well. And I think that's probably going to take a whole new key keynote speech to address. But both time and um, budget aren't completely insurmountable because the commitment that we've seen from the leaders in the NHS today and everybody else and the pledges on the wall, if we can bring all of that to life and actually make them more than words, then those barriers shouldn't really be insurmountable. We've mentioned loads of different words, and I think in terms of real NHS jargon, this conference has done pretty well, but there have still been lots of terms that we've been debating what they actually mean in real life. So, self-management. Does that still mean to us what it means to you? Co-production, participation, engagement, involvement. There's actually a hundred different ways to explain all of these different things. And we could probably spend another two days just debating the semantics of all of this. But I think the best way to do this is to, the best way to try and understand all of these words is actually just to do it and to see what it is in practice. So actually, what does it feel like to do something in co-production? And what does it feel like to be engaged? So rather than just having words that we're debating the semantics about, actually, why don't we try and talk about the emotions that those are bringing and because we've experienced those emotions by actually putting this all into practice. So, in terms of outcomes from today and yesterday, what we really like to see, and I think this is echoed right at the very beginning, is for something to change as a result of today, and not just for all of the ideas that we've said to stay within these four walls. And I think the first stage of that is to try and measure the impact that we've had as a people's panel. And evidence-based medicine has been mentioned a couple of times already, sometimes positively and sometimes not quite so positively. But hopefully from today, we've got the building blocks to try and start to create the evidence to show that actually things like the people panel and the way we've held conversations over the last couple of days can actually work. And if we can start to build the evidence for that, then hopefully that will make it easier to try and spread some of this. And so building on the opportunity of today, um, there's been a lot of things said, and we just want to make sure that there's a degree of accountability here. And we want people to feel that having asked us to be here 
and invited us here and having had two days worth of our time. Without wanting to put too much pressure on you, we hope that you feel some sort of responsibility and accountability in terms of delivering your pledges and trying to turn this into a reality. I think there's definite outcomes here for NHS England, and I want to take my hat off to them, UCL partners um, and the organising committee of the conference for having the vision to have something like a people's panel. The fact that the people on the panel haven't necessarily been involved in designing how the two days are going to run has caused a few teething problems during the day. But actually, people like Vivian and NHS England have been really open to our suggestions over the last couple of days. So I'd like to thank them for that. And just to say that we're going to try and create some learning from today together. And hopefully, the way that that will work will hopefully embody some of the wider changes that we're asking for in terms of the whole sphere of long-term health conditions. I'm sorry, this isn't all for NHS England, but we do have another thing we'd like to ask them. We'd like to ask NHS England to contribute some actual hard resources to this. So we want investment in co-design to implement all the things we've been talking at at an early stage in the design process of any services, any new process, or anything we're doing around long-term health conditions. Because at the moment, despite the best intentions, sometimes it feels like we're involved as an afterthought. And as I said earlier, whatever you want to call it, patient and public involvement, co-design, patient leadership, it isn't free. And actually, it's a case of putting some money where your mouth is <laughs> without wanting to sound rude. <laughs> to really create some sort of... <laughs> to create some sort of legacy from this, which is tangible. So I'd like just to finish by thanking NHS England, um, Olivia, and the team's UCL partners and Dodds who've been organising this. But I think by far and away, the biggest thanks have to be to people like Olivia and my friends and colleagues down here in the People's Panel, our honorary members of the People's Panel, Dom and Ali, two other patient leaders who've been here, and I'm sure you'll appreciate, have made a really valuable contribution. It's been possibly one of the most challenging nerve-wracking, <laughs> emotional, but definitely the most humbling experiences um, to have been working with the rest of the People's Panel for the last two days. And I think you guys all owe it to them to actually turn this into a reality. Thank you. Can I just ask the rest of our people's panel um, to come to the front and take their seats? Sanjay's going to stay. Are you going to stay there, Sanjay? Are you going to join? Where do you want to go? You're going to stay with the other people. <laughs> um, so we just want to take some time um, building a bit, really, on what Anya so eloquently set out there about people's experiences over the last few days. To just tease out, I suppose, the impact it's had for all of you and your views on what all of them could do and perhaps what we could all do together. So has anybody got any reflections that they'd like to start us off with? You weren't quiet in room A. <laughs> Sanjay. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank Anya, because I think she's been a fantastic spokesperson from our point of view. Um, and actually, the fact that I am sitting here is a reflection on everybody else in the room that I feel, you know, actually that people are genuinely buying in um, to what we're kind of suggesting um, needs to happen to improve things. Uh, and I think this is always going to be work in progress, but I think this week, couple of days, has been great progress. So thank you to everybody. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Sanjay, thank you. Um, yeah, it has been quite a couple of days. Um, I thought I wasn't going to get emotional about this, but actually just listening to Anya now, I'm just start holding back the tears. Because I think it's been groundbreaking 
I think it's been... I feel like I'm at the beginning of something big. I feel like I'm at the beginning of change. Um, and what we can't, we can't let happen is for all of you guys to go away and just pay lip service to this. I feel so passionately. My journey, there's some people in this room that know my journey, but you know, mine really has been from the, to the bottom up. And every day I feel um, blessed to be a part of something that could make a lot of change, sorry, make big changes. Um, but I also realize that I've been doing this for an awfully long time. And, you know, we're still very much at the beginning. But to actually be in this, this environment where people are making pledges to make change, I just really hope that we're all around long enough to see those changes go into action. Because, you know, it's, it has been an, a, an exhausting couple of days. But as Joan said earlier, it's, it's been a painful couple of days, but that pain is worth it if we see the change at the end of everything. Thank you very much. I think I, um, except what uh, Angie was saying, we've spent two days here. Um, we've put a lot of work into this. We've made plenty of comments. Um, what needs to happen is you guys out there need to listen to what we've said. And you need to act on it. Not three months, six months, 12 months, two years down the line. It needs to be done from now, from today. Because otherwise, if you don't, then unfortunately, it's not going to work. It's you guys that can make it work. If we put, we put the input in, we've given you the start of what we think needs to happen. It needs you guys to, and especially NHS England, and if necessary, politicians, get politicians behind everybody. It needs to be done because the NHS cannot go backwards. They've got to go forwards. And it's the likes of all these people, of colleagues on the panel here, that have helped it, are trying to help it happen. That's cool. Thank you, Ray. I've been involved for a little while with the National Voices, and I was part of the team that actually wrote the narrative. So it's been brilliant, actually, to, uh, to come here and to see that it's actually filtering through now. The narrative that was started in May, was presented in May, is now going forward. But it does need to move into the north of England, unfortunately. <laughs> it's very much still in, in the south. Um, please don't forget us in the north. Um, yeah, it's from from a lot of the workshops that I've been to. Um, it is it's good that things are happening. It's very positive, but unfortunately, I've I've witnessed a lot of negatives in the in the north of England. Um, the uh, self management courses that were being presented are no longer there. Once the CCGs took over, it's no longer happening. It's just been stopped. And we need this. In order to self-manage, people have to be taught. And it's something that you have to work with every day. But people need to be given that base to start with to know how they're going to self-manage. So please, anyone from the North, please invest in the, in the expert patient self-management, whatever you want to call it. But uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's been really good. Really learned a lot from the rest of the panel. And um, I hope that we're going to be able to meet up again. We've asked that we can get together in six months' time to see what you've done about what we've said here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. So there is a real plea, actually, about information and support. So at the, if you haven't made a pledge, perhaps you could think about what your role in, as an information giver or as a signposter to where the great information is to help people. And perhaps if you're a commissioner, you could think about what information support and self-management support you're making available for your populations. Just a thought. Um, it feels like we're asking you to do a lot. We're asking for that house to be built. But you don't need to build it on your own because we, the patients, are all here and we will help you to build the house. 
And just remember that. We want to help and we will. It's all about partnership. Cool. Thank you, Lynn. You, Jane, and then Sue. I will echo what has been said because up north where I live, um, although as you can guess, I'm not even from England, so I suppose I do have a jig. Um, the north always does seem to be left out. So hopefully, as um, my colleagues have said, is that, that people will realise that what's at the centre is important. It's about patience. And one thing I will say is that I've seen a few Homer Simpson moments, which I call the dough moments, where people have actually started to realise and make the connection that patients will help and can help and will help make a difference. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm, um, this is really the first thing like this I've ever been involved in. I mean, usually I'm actually sitting on the front row as a journalist writing up the meeting. Um, so it's a slightly surreal experience for me. And actually, I've always resisted becoming involved because um, the fact that I've had long-term health problems, I've always seen as sort of slightly irrelevant <laughs> to what I'm really about. And um, I, I, I've been kind of enlightened myself. Um, it was only recently that I discovered that I'd been self-caring for years, although I hadn't realized it. Um, I just didn't understand the jargon. I was distressed when I, I read Jackie's account and also heard her because my husband spent um, four weeks in intensive care in 1997, and I had exactly the same experience as Jackie when he came out, and I was incredibly distressed to find that people are still having that experience. Um, we were asked during the, the breakout, the lunch we managed to grab, um, would we consider continuing with this? And, and um, I think, to be honest, there were a few of us who were a bit doubtful but I think the people I've spoken to, just individuals in the audience, there's obviously so much good practice out there. I think the challenge for NHS England is to make sure that the um, people, the resistors who continue to hold the means of production, um, we could have a bit of creative destruction or creative revolution in there. Not the complete Maoist revolution, but perhaps a little bit of cultural re-education, it would be very helpful for us all. Thank you very much, Sue. Jonathan. I've um, been at this business of being a person <laughs> and, and being shattered and overwhelmed and, and struggling hour by hour for 38, 36 years. God, how old I was. 36 years. You know, it took 20 years, which is, what, 7,000 days. Excuse my maths. Um, for someone to ask me what my opinion was. For someone to give me the opportunity to give back what I'd learned. For someone to ask me to actually help design services. 20 years, I can tell you, as you already know, is a long time in life, but sometimes an even more arduous time in illness or sickness or poor health. So I guess I've got a request. What I think um, we've tried to do today and yesterday, and I, my hat's off to the courageous leadership that has facilitated this process in a way that I've never personally experienced, is we've tried to begin to think about how each of us can learn from those who are in my eyes, the real experts. And we've done that in the last two days, perhaps because we've just bumped into people, or perhaps someone said something and it struck a chord. And we've 
got engaged. And therefore I ask that no one else in the lives of anyone present today will have to wait 20 years before they're asked what their opinion is, before they're asked to share their extraordinarily rich and, and powerful insights into how to change the system. Please, let's not do that. I ask each of you to have the courage to take off your clinical hat, to put a person hat back on, and just to have a conversation. Just to force yourself, because that's what it sometimes takes when you're as busy as I know you all are, to commit to five minutes a day to talk to a person. You will be absolutely astonished at what you learn. I mean, you really will. So please, let's take this concept, this idea of treasuring and valuing the insights of those who live with it, hour in, hour out, night in, day out, forward into everything you do. Thank you. Jackie, just to put you on the spot, I just wonder if you might like to, to make a further reflection, having heard some of these views, and I suppose your experience of living and experiencing what you experienced in 1997, um, and I went through with my dad on a number of occasions over the last 12 years. Um, I just wonder if you've got any reflections. I'm very struck, can you see that tonight? Very struck um, hearing the very articulate and wonderful speeches from all the people on the panel in that in how many years have I been a journalist? I can't think, but I've been to numerous, numerous conferences, seminars, discussions about health policy. I've been to things with the King's Fund, I've been to things with the Labour Party, with the Conservative Party, with all sorts of pressure groups, the Fabians, you name it, we talked about the NHS. I have never, in all those years, been anywhere where there's been patients. <laughs> And I think, wow, what a wonderful innovation. And I just think, <laughs> why has this not happened before? <laughs> and why do we not have <laughs> railway users designing the railways? And, <laughs> of course, it's so obvious, isn't it? But I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but I think so often this is what's happened. It's, it, there's been an attitude that's grown up with the NHS is you're bloody lucky to have it, which we are. I hasten to say, we certainly are. But, you know, you come along, you wait for your appointment for two hours, um, you take what the doctor says and you thank you very much, you doff your cap and you go off again. And we kind of grew up with that sense of deference towards the NHS and to doctors because it's so wonderful and we're so grateful, so desperately grateful for it. And actually, you're right, people do need to listen to patients who so often have some very simple ideas as to what can be done to make the system work better for everybody, not just for the patients, but for everybody, um, for the economy, for the, for the administrators and for everyone. And I just think this is the start. I think you're right, we use it as a start of something big. I think it could be the start of a really good change. And I'm delighted to see the top bods here. <laughs> and um, let's hope that we really do see some change. Thank you very much, Jackie. Is there anybody else from the panel that would like a closing comment? Um, and if I look to the floor to see if there's anybody who wants to make any comments or insights over the last couple of days? Are we going to let Martin speak? <laughs> hey. There is a gentleman there. we we'll let you speak occasionally. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Eric. I'm a GP from Swindon. Um, I, I, one of the things that's on the agenda nationally is integration. And just to let you know, Swindon's done health and social care integration. Um, and it doesn't solve all your problems. Um, what I've learned today was uh, the integration we haven't done as well as we ought is the integration with the patients and particularly with the community. Uh, it's a very powerful speaker this afternoon um, with some very useful capital to offer. You know, I think the professionals are burnt out and done in and have got nothing left to give. Um, and that's at least as true in social care as health. 
Uh, the pot is empty. Like I say, integrating two broke budgets doesn't create a financial solution. The capital we need to grab is sitting over there and in the communities around us. And uh, it's difficult because they're not professionals. We don't know how to deal with them. We're nervous about sharing stuff with each other, never mind the public. But we've got to do it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when we say they're not professionals, actually they probably are very professional in managing their own lives and their own care packages. Um, and they often have professional occupations as well, where they do stuff. Um, so I think... I <laughs> Is that what makes you professional? I ain't got one of those either. Um, so I think there is something in, in some of the, the power of these messages is about we're in this together. This is about a partnership of equals and that we all have something to contribute. But ultimately, it's contributing so that people can live healthy, happy, fulfilled lives um, in a way that they can control and manage themselves. And, and that those people who are best placed to tell you whether that's happening are patients or people or citizens. Um, thank you very much. Um, to every single panel member um, and to every single one of you for, for participating in this com conversation. Um, I'd like to come back to it when we have the Healthcare Innovation Expo in Manchester in March next year. And I'd like to think that in March next year, I'm looking at Martin, uh, we can actually report back on what has happened, what is different as a result of today. So if you were brave enough to put a pledge downstairs with an email address on it, you might find that you get an email from somebody, Martin, um, asking you what you've done um, and what's different. Um, and I think we'd like to, to, to hear some of those stories about the actions that you might have taken to do or think or act differently as a result of your experience over the last two days. Um, thank you all very much. Martin, Peter. It's over to you. Yeah. Thanks very much. So, Peter, um, I, I, yeah, what a journey. Uh, so, 12 months ago, I was appointed into this job. Shortly afterwards, <laughs> met you. And uh, <laughs> thank God I met my psychiatrist early in the job. <laughs> and, and, and we talked about this conference, about doing, doing, doing something of this nature. Um, I had no idea it would end up like this. What, just your reflections on the close. So I've been working for uh, like 40 years. I've had loads of ideas, but I never thought that this thing would work. The idea of actually co-producing a conference with patients to kind of create a new initiative. Uh, it was kind of co-produced between us, but it actually, uh, I had a lot of worries about it, exactly as uh, you said, a lot of anxieties. Uh, and I couldn't be, even if you got a hundred things wrong, I couldn't really be a happier person than I am at the moment. Because I do feel that we are actually starting something completely new. We are actually on a new journey. That everybody who's here, whether they've left early for their weekend or not, They've actually left with the idea that they can't go back and do things in exactly the same way that they've done it before. That actually they have to take on board, if it's the last thing they do, they have to take on board what the people that they are serving, what the people that they are serving want of them. And that's it's ridiculous that it took us 65, it, but actually, uh, it probably has taken us uh, a lot longer than that, if you go back to the origin thing. It is such a, for me, it's such a discovery that really in the way that we design the services that we create for the people has to be done with the people that we create these services for. It's so simple, but it has never been done really properly. So I'm looking forward to that. What was your experience? Um, oh, well, I think mine's summed up in one word. I feel humbled. Um, I think the, the, the power of uh, the narrative, the engagement, the willingness to give, and the constructive approach from the People's Panel 
makes me realize uh, that, that this, is, this is completely a force for good. And um, uh, I think um, I need to digest everything that's come out of this conference. Um, we need to reflect on it. We need to really study it. And then we need to move forward um, and, and commit. So I'm going to challenge you, Peter. What are you going to do specifically as a result of this conference? I think it's time. <laughs> uh, but there are three things that I, I feel uh, that I have learned that I need to take away and do. One is that I'm, I'm, I'm an academic. I've been an academic all, uh, all my life. And, uh, a professor is someone who talks in someone else's sleep. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of professors here, obviously, <laughs> speaking from experience. Uh, so a professor is someone who spe uh, speaks in someone else's sleep. But I, I, uh, one of the things that I uh, now take away as much, I think this implementation science as a whole is not very far advanced. Uh, and we need to learn uh, more about how to do things well. The implementation science of co-production is, in its, to say this it is its foothills, as it was said earlier, is, I think, uh, flattering ourselves. Uh, it is just, we just don't know how to do it well. And what I think we need to do, and that's one of my pledges, is that we will co-produce co-production. That is, we won't go ahead and produce co-production. The first lesson that I learned is that I can't go ahead and produce co-production. That, that I have to co-produce co-production. And uh, so that's my pledge number one. What's your pledge number one? <laughs> this could get nasty. <laughs> um, Bruce was very clear uh, when he spoke this morning. It's great when your boss comes along and sets you your next objective. <laughs> and um, we need to create some real products from this that actually, I talk about my job as, having, as being the three eyes. What's the impact we're trying to deliver? I think we've heard that today. What are the inputs that would help deliver that impact? And I think we'll have material from this conference which will help us think about the inputs in a complex system. There won't be one magic bullet, but lots of things we could apply and keep applying and plan, do, study, act to try and create the right system. And then the third eye is the influence I can bring to try and make sure those inputs are created so we do try and deliver that impact. And that's, that's what I'm going to do, is look at, come back with actions not just rhetoric. And the challenge that was later, I'd, I'd written this down, where is she? She stitched me up. Um, is, 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 is to meet, at, in six months, to meet and explain my actions or inactions to this. Because that's going to scare me witless. <laughs> so we'll have to come back. And I don't mind if it's at the expo or in a pub or wherever's convenient, <laughs> preferably in a pub, please. <laughs> wherever's convenient, I'll come back and I'll tell you what I've done or what I haven't done, or you'll find that I've left the country. But maybe uh, uh, we should uh, uh, be aware of the enormous effort that you guys have put in and the state that you're in that really, uh, uh, I, I'm talking about myself, I'm just too tired. <laughs> But maybe we should uh, uh, draw this wonderful, wonderful confidence to a close. And you know, really, I'm speaking totally from the bottom of my heart when I say that it has been, for me, a completely different experience from any of the conferences I've been to. That it has been a terrific success is really due to you guys. And uh, uh, I just personally want to thank you. I also though, want to thank the guys from UCL Partners who uh, worked with us. Uh, really the, the person uh, who uh, actually from behind moved 
many of the limbs ar around here was Dr. Anna Moore, uh, who, uh, whose idea this collaborative conference originally uh, should be attributed to, uh, but also Vivian Chai and uh, Rachel Pennison from UCL Partners, who have really worked incredibly hard and incredibly effectively. And if I can raise a round of applause from you for these guys, and please. So if I can just echo that, um, somebody said to me, you know, you've organized a, a great conference. And I said, no, my contribution was I got out of the way. <laughs> um, and uh, Ed, where's Ed? Ed Mitchell, my clinical fellow, and Gabriella, where's, uh, she hasn't had the baby yet, yeah. no good. <laughs> uh, Gabriella, um, uh, from NH and all the people from NHS England who've, who've supported this and given us the freedom to do this. Um, it's, been a, it's been a roller coaster of a ride, and I think there's more of the roller coaster ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Dodds for the support they gave us as well, and to our speakers, uh, people like Jeremy, um, Cyril, who helped open the conference, um, and uh, everyone. It's, it's been a fantastic experience. We've now got to go away, and it's not over for us. Now the really hard work starts for us. Yeah. We've got to take this, assemble it, and turn it into tools and build the house of care. Thank you. Safe trip home, and have a great weekend.